I notice it's a little delayed. Hey, everybody. Welcome to today's Our Studio Enterprise Community Meetup. I'm joined here by Tom, and we're just chatting for a second to see if the LinkedIn stream is working as well. How are you doing today, Tom? I'm doing great. Happy Tuesday. It's always a good day of the week. <laughs> awesome. Let me go over to LinkedIn and see if we cool. can see ourselves While over there yet. That, I'll just mention that um, for today's slides, the link will be at the bottom uh, of every slide. So you can always copy it from there if you come in later. Um, as well as we're going to be screen sharing and using multiplex for the first time today, which will allow us to like actually change the slide on other people's computers, which is kind of neat. So we'll try that out. Awesome. Well, look at that. It is working on LinkedIn. So hi, friends. Thank awesome. you so much for joining today. Welcome to the R Studio Enterprise Community Meetup. I'm Rachel. I know I've met so many of you already. So thank you for joining back today. I'm calling in from Boston today, and we are streaming out to LinkedIn and YouTube right now. So if you've just joined now, feel free to say hi through the chat, maybe where you're calling in from. So excited to have you here for our third Cordo meetup in the past few months. Um, if you missed the past two, uh, welcome to Cordo workshop and building a blog with Cordo. I'll be, share, I'll be sure to share those in the chat as well. But today we are joined by my friend here at our studio, Tom Mock, who is going to teach us about building beautiful reports and presentations with Cordo. If this is your first time joining one of these sessions, this is a friendly and open meetup environment for teams to share use cases, teach lessons learned, and just meet each other and ask questions. Together, we're all dedicated to making this an inclusive and open environment for everybody, no matter your experience, industry, or background. So I will also share a link in the chat where you can find out about other upcoming events too, because we have these meetups every Tuesday at 12 Eastern time. We also have a data science hangout every Thursday at 12 Eastern time. We'd love to see you at those too. I just wanna say during the event today, you are able to ask questions on the platform that you're watching from, and it will pull together here for us, or also anonymously through Slido. Um, and we'll share that link in just a second here and pull it up on the screen. But thank you again so much for joining us here today. I'm so excited to have you with us here too, Tom. And I will turn it over to you. Awesome, thanks so much for hosting Rachel and for all your help in getting this stuff off the ground. Um, we're going to be talking about beautiful reports and presentations with Cordo. Uh, it feels a little bit meta in the sense that like you're, you're presenting about Cordo with Cordo on Cordo, kind of like all the things wrapping up together. And something we're trying out today, and I think one of the benefits of using a format like Cordo or Reveal.js through Cordo is that uh, like for now, Rachel's actually sharing her screen. So I'm able to actually advance and modify slides on her computer just by changing them on mine. So you can imagine a situation kind of like today where maybe my computer is acting a little funky and I'm actually allowing my colleague to screen share or to work you know, remotely on their own computer or like for y'all, if you access the slides from the URL at the bottom of the screen, um, I can actually advance and, and kind of display the slides as you're progressing through them, uh, whether in a teaching setting or in uh, kind of this webinar style setting. So we're going get, to get kicked off and I will run with it. So first off, I just want to mention that, you know, we talk about this pretty frequently, but uh, Cordo and our studio have very deep integration together. So you have what's called the visual editor. Um, so this is just a, a screenshot of a few different things from the visual editor mode in our studio. You can use this to do word processing and kind of modification of Cordo documents, including presentations. And there's lots of helpers there for inserting divs and spans, some of the things we'll be talking about, as well as things like tables, graphics, links, code chunks lots of help in terms of making you more productive. One of the benefits that Cordo provides is that uh, the visual editor mode is available for really all the different formats. So again, whether you're writing a presentation or a report or something else, those can all be edited in, in visual editor mode. 
the first thing we're going to talk about for today, and we've got a lot of kind of content to cover. So I'm trying to provide a lot of uh, overview and kind of exciting, uh, broad overview of things that are available in Cordo. So first off, we have static documents or essentially reports that you're writing. I like to think of these as like your, your daily driver. You know, you can use it for basic kind of exploratory work, but it's powerful enough to also present uh, and kind of display results to your colleagues, uh, even publish to a journal or as the final output for your team to share with uh, leadership or other stakeholders. I think Cordo and static documents are most powerful when they're combining this idea of like written thoughts and observations, like the human in the loop in terms of I'm adding context and adding prose and text about what I'm working on. But I'm also including the source code there so I can be reproducible in creating my journal article or creating my documentation or creating my report that I'm putting together. So in that spirit of kind of combining source code with, uh, with the report they're actually generating, we're going to kick off by talking about parameters and parameterized quarter reporting. You may have used these in our markdown, or maybe you never used parameters in our markdown before. Uh, but parameters work inside Quarto as a way to create different variations of the same document by changing out small components. Uh, most commonly, you see examples of this like, um, I want to create a report for this specific region. So like for today's Tidy Tuesday data, it's you know 50 different states and all the different things that are available within those. And you could imagine I want to generate a report for Texas as well as um, Massachusetts or New York or California, like all these different states that I want to create separate reports for. But it could also be covering a specific time period. So if you're doing like a time series analysis, maybe you want to report over the, you know, the past year, but maybe someone asks you, say, okay, well, I just need the data for the past month. Rather than restarting that report from scratch, you could actually use parameters to regenerate that with just changing out the date. Or kind of the last example, just rerunning a single analysis multiple times and changing components. So maybe you're doing machine learning uh, with Heidi models and you're switching out the different engines that are available uh, for that model. So you can still do like a random forest, but change it out from Ranger to the random forest model to a Spark model, for example. And we'll walk through a few of these different examples. There's two ways uh, of actually defining parameters. Uh, in Python, if you're using that with Cordo, we use what's called uh, paper mill style, which is a way of, again, providing parameters and generating many reports from one set of source code. In this situation, uh, the tags are actually generated um, within the code chunk. So you use the hash pipe syntax, then you define tags, and then you have like a vector of parameters that you're creating. So in this case, we have alpha and ratio that are being defined as both being 0 0.1. These can be accessed later on in the document by name. So they're not, um, they're, they're really kind of like first class objects in the situation of like, you can't name something else alpha or ratio. Those are going to be the actual um, in kind of memory object that you're using in Python. In R or using the knitter engine, uh, we'll define them in the YAML. So you'll use what are called the params key, and then you can define specific uh, parameters there, again, like alpha and ratio, and giving specific values, whether they're numeric or text or other strings. These are accessed in source code um, using the params dollar sign syntax. So you'll actually extract something like alpha from the params environment. In this situation, uh, you could actually have alpha being in the um, in memory as an object, and then params dollar sign alpha that you can access separately. But generally, you don't really want to name them exactly the same to avoid kind of namespace collisions. The last option here is you can actually define and modify parameters from your command line interface to Cordo or via the terminal. So if you call Cordo render on a specific document, you can modify the parameters with the dash P and then de define the new parameter you want to change. So if I wanted to change alpha to 0.2 and ratio to 0.3, I could have multiple calls with uh, dash P and then alpha equals 0.2 and dash P ratio equals 0.3. And again, so regardless of kind of how you're building out your document, what language you're using, there's, there's these ways to approach it and modify the document so that when you're generating it, you can get multiple reports from the same set of source code. 
now that we've kind of talked a little bit about what parameters, kind of how they're defined, let's actually show a little bit of how those could be used. So I have this example of a pretty simple report. Um, in this case, we're using the Palmer Penguins data set and we're generating out a report that looks something like this on the right. Just says, you know, when it was published and it's got data about this set of penguins and, and which ones are classified as this specific species. At the top left of this slide on uh, line five of the YAML, it says params equals species equals to Adelai. So that's the default in terms of if we render this document as is, it's actually going to always generate a report for Adelai penguins. You know, it's not changing itself unless we say we're going to change it. But we can access that parameter with params dollar sign species in a couple of different locations. So we can use it in our filter step on line eight of the first code chunk. And we can also use it in uh, inline code with the uh, backtick r params dollar sign species. And again, report on it both in inline code as well as in our overall code chunk. But the big takeaway being we could actually change out that parameter to a different species and actually get a whole new report from the same, uh, same Cordo document. So if we were to do this via the CLI, we might do something like Quarto render that report or Quarto render that report as say like an IPython notebook if we're doing it uh, from Jupyter uh, in that situation. And then we could define specific um, parameters with the dash P and change species to gen two and get this gen two dollars uh, report out as opposed to uh, a different name. So we can actually say the output is gonna be a new report name because we don't want to overwrite the existing Adelai report that we've generated. So this is fine in terms of like, I can render it with the CLI, I can modify that parameter on the fly, um, but maybe I don't want to use the command line interface to do this rendering. I could also do it with something like pure R code. So I might have a render function I write. In this case, I'm using the R package Quarto and Quarto underscore render. And this allows me to take in an existing report, penguinreport.qmd, modify the parameters according to which species we're applying, and then name the report according to, again, which, which species we're reusing. So here we can find all the unique species uh, across this whole data set, walk across them, or re regenerate the report with the per R package, and render that on each of the three penguin species. This will create something like the Adelai report, the Chinstrap report, and the Gen2 report, all of which have slightly different parameters that have been uh, modified. And now we have three different versions of the report by species, as opposed to having to rewrite the entire report from scratch or copy paste code across. So using parameterized reports like this, even if you're doing it for you know, really sophisticated, uh, nice looking reports that you're building, is one of the powers and kind of superpowers of using code and using things like Quarto to generate out those documents. Another example that might be more applicable to folks coming from like the machine learning aspect is maybe you have a report and uh, you know we'll just say that we're adapting it from some tidy model stocks. In this case, we're using our parameter of a specific engine. So the default is using the Ranger engine, and we're using that for a random forest model. But we could also change out that engine to any other engines that um, the Tidy Models ecosystem can accept. So we can take that same Tidy Models example report, use the random forest engine or the Ranger engine or Spark engine. And again, all you know, reusing most of the source code, but just changing out that engine and running it in a slightly different context. If we do this, we can actually generate out two sets of kind of predictions or two sets of metrics from this report. So, you know, these really don't look any different, but just that we have run the report twice. And if you look at some of the very small value changes, we can actually see that the values did change. So like on line nine on both sides, we have a prediction of 5.25 versus 5.32. And the accuracy or the RMSE and some other metrics are actually slightly better when we use the Ranger uh, engine for this. So regardless, in terms of like whether you're trying to regenerate a new report that you're actually using to tell a story, or if you're doing exploratory analysis and doing like different models or different engines that you're trying to run, you can use parameters to modify and uh, decrease the amount of code that you have to write 
for doing those steps. So while I think parameters are really exciting and I wanted to kick off with that as like, there's a benefit to using code. One of the other benefits that Quarto provides is, you know, regardless of if you're using lots of code or changing it out or reusing it, you might actually want to generate multiple different types of outputs. So maybe you're creating a PDF document, a Word document, and an HTML report. You know, those are three different ecosystems that all take quite different um, kind of code behind the scenes. Quarto, as much as possible, tries to um, make that code easy to use in terms of using the same syntax across all, all of them and unifying the work that you're doing across different output formats. So let's say we have this report. Uh, I have a dog named Howard who's a Boston Terrier. So I took an example from Wikipedia. Uh, there's this article about Boston Terriers. I copied it over and converted it to a, uh, a Quarto document. So with this unified syntax, I could do something like Quarto render that document to HTML or to PDF. Now, I haven't optimized this document only for HTML, uh, meaning I haven't written a bunch of CSS, and I haven't optimized this document only for PDF, meaning I haven't written a lot of LaTeX or really any LaTeX. I've only used Quarto style syntax for this, or kind of unified syntax that works across formats. When I generate this report out, I get something that looks like this, where I have a nice looking article, I've got an image in the gutter, I've got hoverable citations, I've got a floating table of contents. You get all of the power of what HTML can provide for a nice you know, report or document you're creating. But without changing that document and literally just saying render to PDF, I also get a really nice looking PDF document that's paginated and has, you know, whatever the limitations are of PDF, like doing that. In terms of it still reports on the history, it still has citations and images in the uh, sidebar or the margin, um, but I haven't necessarily had to optimize only for HTML or only for PDF. I was actually able to use Quarto's unified syntax across both very different uh, kind of outputs that I'm creating. So we're gonna dive in a little bit to what the syntax is, how you can use it to kind of be safe as to the different type of outputs you're creating and walk across some of that. And what I mean by this unified syntax is that Quarto makes heavy use of what are called fence divs and bracketed spans. So here on this page, we have fence divs. We have three colons that start the fence and three colons that end the fence. So you can imagine that when you're writing these, you always need to have kind of a front and a start or the enclosing of some content within those. Once we've used three colons to indicate the start and the end, we can then apply a specific class or a specific name of the uh, div that we're applying. So it might be something like dot class or dot panel tab set or, or whatever it is, just some name within those curly brackets that are after the fence div. And then anything within the start and end of that fence div will be modified. So everything inside that will be affected in some way, or you can alter it in a useful way moving forward. This structure, again, starts and ends with an equal number of colons. There's always a minimum of three, but they can be however many colons you want, as long as it's three or more, and you match the start to the end. You're going to add those curly brackets after uh, the three colons. And this indicates the start and the end, as well as the class. So again, like dot class, or sometimes it doesn't require that dot. And it might be something like word one dash word two, or sometimes dot uh, dash class. Overall, just that when you see this uh, syntax inside maybe quarter documentation or in other examples, uh, making you aware of what those mean. One example of how to do this is we can actually do figure layout of different images and include like alt text with them and other things. So we'll have three colons, curly bracket, layout number of columns equals to two. And this will create a two column layout. And as long as you have two images, it'll put one on the left, one on the right, and then it'll start over. And if you added more images, it would stack them always adding up to two columns. You can modify this and have number of rows or number of columns be larger, but overall just showing that this type of syntax, again, can apply to Word or to PDF or to HTML. 
It's basically allowing you to be safe across different types of output formats. Another example of how to use this is something like .panel tabset. Now this one is very specific to HTML, but I just wanna show off kind of some of the things you can do with this. Some of it can be used only for protecting yourself against different output formats. And other times it can just be useful in terms of uh, providing cool things that HTML can do. So a dot panel dash tab set allows you to create little uh, tabs that you can step through and kind of organize your code in that way. After you create the fence div, again, with three colons to start, three colons to end, and then your class of dot panel dash tab set, you'll define specific tabs by level two headers. So, you know, two pound signs, element one, that'll be your first tab, two pound signs, element two, that'll be your second tab. And then you can have content within each of them. What this looks like in practice is you might actually have um, code and output. So if I were to click on code first, it'll just show off the code that is unevaluated. But if Rachel were to click on output, it would actually show the output there on her screen. So now she can actually click through and see, you know, have some type of interactivity or have some type of interaction with the document in addition to me actually having to step through all of it. Again, this is limited to HTML output because there's that true interactivity, but just showing that um, these, these fence divs are not just for kind of doing some of the basics, but allow you to do more across all the different HTML formats as well. If I wanted to create or show how that was actually uh, shown on the page, um, that dot panel tab set, and then I have a level two header code. I have some you know, R code that I'm putting in there. I have another level two header called output. And that one is actually going to eval equals true, basically show the output, but echo equals false and not show um, the source code itself. This is just a basic example, but you can imagine that you could have, again, these multiple tab sets that you're using with fence divs, allowing the user to explore your document and interact more with it um, as they're reading through or walking through the document. The other item that allows you to, again, either protect yourself against different formats you're creating for, or just do cool things are what are called bracketed spans. We have a sentence on this page that is missing some words. This is a magic text, basically text that shows up after the fact when I click next on my side of the screen. We can do this again with what is called a bracketed span. So we do square brackets around specific text, in this case, magic text for the previous example we were showing. And then just like with our uh, fence divs, we apply a specific class to that text. The main difference between these two is that a fence div will apply to like an entire paragraph or a collection of text. And a bracketed span could be applied to a single word or single words within an overall sentence. So you can imagine, you know, applying to the whole paragraph versus small components of that, again, to, you know, help tell your story or indicate something on the page. Here I'm using a dot fragment class, which is specific to presentations. But this lets you actually delay the presentation and delay the specific word to show up later as you're moving through that slide deck. So overall, you know, bracketed spans can do a lot, but just showing one example here quickly inside the presentation format. The structure would be something like this. You're going to surround specific text that you want to affect or the specific object you want to affect with square brackets around it. And again, you have a left and a right square bracket indicating a start and an end of what's being modified. Once that is written out, you're gonna add curly brackets to indicate the start and end of the specific class. So something like curly bracket dot class or dot fragment, and then closing it off with another curly bracket so that it can be fully interpreted. And again, this just allows you to modify specific components of the text or style your document um, in, in specific ways. One example that's a slight modification of this and one that we use in that report about Boston Terriers is we actually create inline footnotes. So something like some inline text with a kind of tilde and then the square bracket footnote or this uh, up, up arrow kind of symbol. 
this allows us to add a footnote or kind of this like endnote to a specific word. So in the document, it'll show this as like a hyperlink back to the footnote or the endnote, but also allow you to inject a lot of text about that overall. So it could be kind of like a citation or just an aside or a comment that you're making that you don't want to display all the time. In HTML, these can be hoverable in terms of in an HTML document, I can actually hover over those footnotes and see them displayed kind of as an overlay in the document. In a PDF, they don't necessarily have the ability to render that additional JavaScript or CSS. So they're just linked to the uh, footnote or the endnote at the end of the page or at the end of the document. And what this looks like in practice is I might have a, a sentence like, for example, did you know that Howard is a dog? And then adding a specific footnote, specifically, he is a Boston Terrier, although sometimes he acts like a cat. So by providing that footnote, you know, that specifically all the way through cat, that whole section is hidden on the page, but added as this footnote, providing an additional context about the sentence as we're walking through it. So if you're using this for kind of scientific documentation or just kind of a side that you're making a, a useful thing to add to your documents. The unified syntax can also do more complex things in terms of we move back to fence divs, we can overall structure our document. So here from that actual article I showed, I have a mixing of images, aligning those with text and paragraphs and putting it together something like this. Uh, so for here, I've applied a layout class and I have the image as 30% of the width of the page and then layout equals to 70% for paragraph one. And then below that, uh, 100 indicating that paragraph two will take up the remaining uh, width of the page below the other two. And again, regardless of the output format, PDF or Word or HTML, I can structure and kind of typeset my document using this type of syntax. I can also move one of those images into the margin. So, you know, I had the small boss interior that was on the right side of the screen. I have a traditional kind of hyperlink to an image on this page. And then um, I have a specific um, class on that called a dot column dash margin. And that actually takes the image and throws it into the margin of the overall document while the rest of the body continues on. And then as we talked about just previously, add things like footnotes. So information about where did I get this detail? The average life of a Boston Terrier is around 11 to 13 years. This was you know, retrieved from the Boston Terrier Club of America and providing additional context about that citation or around that detail that we're adding. So this unified syntax, again, while I think that writing for HTML is some of the most powerful way you can actually do this, uh, in certain situations, you have to write to PDF or you want to write to PDF or to Word docs so you can collaborate on them in a different way. You can use this unified syntax across different output formats with a Quarto report you're putting together. Again, while I think that um, Quarto reports, you know, in terms of making them look beautiful and, and typesetting them is very useful, ultimately a different value that Quarto provides is that it can also add code and both the display of that code, the hiding of that code or you know, just the output of that code itself as a graphic, as a table, or as raw text. So in your document, you might have something like this, where you have an HTML document you're creating, and you want to uh, have you know, the code not be shown. Maybe you're generating a report that's going up to leadership. They don't necessarily want to read R code or Python code. They just want to see the final report. They don't necessarily care how you got there. Maybe they, they just want to see the details. So in this case, you can still keep the source code. So you can keep your .qmd that has all of the source code, the links out to the data, basically how you got there. But when you generate out your report, it doesn't show any of the code. It just shows the output and the commentary that you've added to it. You can still turn on code individually. So let's say you turned on echo equals false at the top in the YAML. At the code chunk level, you can actually add and say like, for this one code chunk, I want it to be echo equals true. So regardless of what the YAML says, turn echo and actually show the code for this specific document. You can also, rather than hide all the code and make it where no one can see it, is you can do what's called code folding. 
And in this case, you'll have um, code folding that you can hide temporarily in terms of it'll fold all the code behind a little um, menu bar that you can click on. And that little menu bar will be called hidden code. So you can click on each individual code chunk and display it and then collapse it as you move forward. And again, this could be uh, turned on at the specific code chunk level where I could have code folding turned on for one code chunk. So even if I was hiding all the rest of it for one that might be really important, I could still say, hey, this one allows you to toggle the code showing on or off again. Going a bit further, you know, maybe we want to show the code, maybe don't want to show the code. We can also use what are called code dash tools. So in your format, you might have format equals HTML or PDF. Code tools equals true gives us this little overlay where the user can make all of the decisions. So at the very top of the document, they can have this little drop down and they can, you know, hide all the code or show all the code or in some situations, even view the source document. So you can embed all of the source code into the document. And when you click on it, that allows you to show all the source code before the results were generated or link out to an external repository. And again, this just allows you to make those decisions as you're using it for reporting, but you can choose how much of the code or how much of the context you want to display for your users. If we wanted to show the source in terms of like literally embed the source code into the document, you could use code tools equals source equals true, uh, toggle equals false, and no caption. And this will allow you to see the source code, but there, all the code is also displayed in the document and you're not trying to hide it. You're just trying to also embed all that source code so that users can see it, or you as you're automating that report can also see how the, the document was generated and if anything has changed over time. Overall, when you display or look at the source code, it might look something like this, where you have an overlay that pops up displaying what was all the source code that you used, literally the markdown, as well as the code chunks and all the options of it. So again, very useful for kind of checking that your source code is actually valid for what your expectations are. For other situations where you don't necessarily want to embed all of the source code into the document, or in some situation where you really don't want to show the code itself, you want to have it in like a private GitHub repository, or maybe it's just really long and you don't want to embed all of that because the user experience is not ideal, you could actually use code tools plus source and indicate an external repository. So here we're linking out to Quarto-dev and linking out to a specific uh, markdown file that displays the source code for that specific page. So they can actually go and look at it on a first class you know, version control system as opposed to embedding it into the document itself. But again, you get to make that decision in terms of displaying the code, hiding the code, embedding the source code, all those different things you can do for your user's experience. We can then move on to things like making the overall document look a bit better. So maybe you do want to show the code, but you have like a dark theme or you have a specific style that you want to apply to the code. So by default, your code might look something like this, where it's highlighting things like library dplyr and your group by and other function calls are highlighted in blue. Your arguments are in green. Uh, and it, it's doing some highlighting of specific components, but it's really white on white with this background. There's a lot of highlighting options that I've included in a link at the full highlighting options, um, but you can modify this throughout your document. So for our different themes, let's say we're using an HTML report, we can stick with highlight style equals arrow, which will look something like this, where you have blue for function calls, you can have logical statements that are a little bit lighter blue, numerics are in red, and it allows you to kind of read the source code a bit easier as opposed to them all being one color, uh, all being black or gray or something. But again, what if you made this into like a dark mode? So here we've modified the YAML header to have the same highlight style of arrow, which is the one we we're trying to use for accessibility reasons for um, contrast and other things. But then we have the ability to toggle on and off uh, a light mode and a dark mode. 
So in Cordo, if you use a theme equals light and theme equals dark and change those out, you can actually have a toggleable option to make it switch from light mode into dark mode. Now this again will modify how the code itself looks on the page because your background is black. So you can use a um, highlight style like arrow that works for both light and dark and it will actually modify the background color of the source code to also match the light or the dark theme. So again, by changing out some of the styling, you can make your overall document look the same or have the same kind of theming or consistency as you move across it. So while you know changing code itself is kind of cool, overall you're probably a bit more interested in what you know what else you can do with that code. Um, so in R, there's a package called Downlet, and this not only provides like syntax highlighting, but also links out to specific source code. So if you're using Downlet and actually evaluating code, this will actually allow you to click on the functions in the chunk, uh, chunk output, and it'll actually link out to the documentation for that. So you imagine someone's like, oh, I saw this cool package called per, and it's got this function called walk that Tom was talking about in the presentation. You can actually click on my source code and click on per walk, and it will take you to the documentation for per walk. So you can read a bit more about that function. So Downlet, again, will provide this linking of the R code to external documentation so that when people find something they've never used before, they can actually move forward into the documentation and have a lot of power there to learn on the fly. So while code is cool, ultimately I think that you want to do something like the overall aesthetics. You have Howard here in his you know, finest garb. He wants to look good for the presentation. You also want your report or your presentation to look nice for your users or for your, uh, your kind of stakeholders. So for HTML documents, out of the box, Quarto is styled with something called Bootstrap 5. And this is a CSS framework for websites and version 5 is one of the latest versions. It's overall applies a lot of different theming to the overall document. So Quarto comes pre-installed with 25 different themes, allowing you to set the aesthetics or the appearance of the overall document. And you can use them in one or two lines of code. So in your YAML header, you might define a format equals HTML and the theme as something like Latera. That is a nice minimal theme that um, really makes the information pop as opposed to trying to make a really fancy background or something. But there's lots of different themes that you can customize and go further. Maybe you want to start from the Latera theme, but further customize it with a .scss file that's modifying the structure or the appearance of the document beyond the defaults that are applied with the Latera theme. So you're not stuck with it. You can continue to customize it with either CSS files or SCSS files, in this case, if you're using the theme output. Bootswatch themes are, you know, there's many of them. Again, I mentioned 25. I just have a small selection of six here on the page. So again, these are gonna change all the different elements, typefaces, menu bars, nav bars, the overall um, kind of weight of different fonts, and then colors uh, of both the background, the foreground, and buttons. So when you're creating these HTML documents, this again allows you to create nice looking documents and not having to change all the specific components yourself, but using these pre-built themes that look really nice out of the box. When I gave some initial overview talk about um, kind of reporting or in our first workshop we did, uh, there was a lot of people asking about PDFs. You know, obviously I think HTML is one of the best formats and you can do the most with it. But in certain situations, uh, like a journal article, they want to get a LaTeX file or they want to get a PDF or in some organizations, just they want PDFs because they're emailing them around or doing things like that. So Quarto can accept what are called templates that allow you to style or kind of take it as a default structure with .tech files. So if you have those laying around or modify them, you can further customize and optimize for PDF if that's the route you want to go. There are, uh, there's also support for uh, kind of first class journal articles from Quarto. So actually taking a document, not having to go and do write all this LaTeX code that you're customizing it with, but just using one of the Quarto journal formats 
and publishing it out to a specific um, kind of specific publication that you want to go to, like the ACM or the Journal of Statistical Science or something like that. And you can end up with a report that looks really, really nice with this journal of statistical software, uh, where again, you're not having to write all of the custom LaTeX to make the PDF look like this, but rather making use of Cordo's built in um, kind of Cordo journals formats that are available and just writing things like, what is the abstract? What is the title? What are the authors and their affiliations? And it will take that and build it into the document to actually provide a useful output or what the journal statistical software is expecting when you actually deliver the article to them. Again, Quarto wants to support this idea of reproducible science, You know, whether that's science in an organization and you're creating kind of static PDFs or HTML documents, or actually publishing in academia to, to journals or to specific journals in some cases. I wanna say there's like 10 or, or 12 uh, journals that are supported as of today, but we're also taking kind of feedback from the community as to what other journals are needed and working with specific uh, groups to, to get those built out. I also want to call out a nice project from the NFMS Open Science team. So they put together uh, a Quarto extension called Quarto Title Pages. The tech templates were written by Eli Holmes, and the Lua filter that kind of makes it available to Quarto was written by Mikael. And they have reports that look something like this. So yes, this is not necessarily like a journal article. This is more of like a professional PDF report they might use in a business setting allow you to put your company logo and stylize the report in a specific way while also adding subtitles and authors and other things to the document. Something that you could deliver in like a consulting setting or in a business setting. There are additional ones, but mostly this is focused on improving the title page, which is a big deal in some of the PDFs and making those look really, really nice uh, as the default. So just wanted to call out some great work that they've already done and linking out to the repository that talks more about that. So we've talked a lot and kind of gone through a lot of different things with reports in terms of HTML reports, theming them, including code, PDF reports and articles and how you can modify those. And I wanna spend the last kind of section of today talking about presentations. Again, I'm using Quarto to write the presentation today about Quarto. So I really believe in the tool and its ability to help you tell stories. There's a lot of supported output types, and I'll just call out three specific ones. Reveal.js, which is an HTML format. That's what I'm using today. It has the most power, and you can use all of kind of HTML and CSS and even some JavaScript to do a lot with your presentation. But there's also support for things like PowerPoint if you need to work in an office setting or Microsoft Office kind of suite. Or if you want really prefer working with like LaTeX or PDF, uh, you can also use the Beamer format to, to work with that structure. So regardless of kind of which format you're gonna do, I'm gonna focus on initially things that are cross format and then talk about some things that are specific to reveal.js that are really powerful and exciting in my mind. I also wanna call out again, two other community resources that I've linked to here on the slides. Um, so Emil uh, wrote this kind of Slidecraft 101. We'll talk about that at the end of the presentation about colors and fonts and using them in Quarto. And then Megan put together this nice overview of customizing Quarto slides and adding little section headings that say like, you know, rather than just being 37 of 58 slides through, which section are we on and, and what's going on in that page? For the things that are shared across the different formats, so again, LaTeX or HTML or PowerPoint, there's many different things that are shared across that. So you can use what are called incremental reveal or incremental lists that allow you to display specific list elements one by one. You can control the column layout, the title, the subtitle, the author, the, you know, the kind of title page of your document. You can control the headings as well as you're using code. So you're able to display that code hide that code and actually generate things like tables, graphics, and text as the output of your code that you're generating from your Quarto presentation. The first thing to remember is, you know, for creating slides, it could be as simple as this. Uh, in the YAML header, define a specific format. So I'm using reveal.js, but that could be PowerPoint X or, um, or Beamer. 
And then each of your additional slides will be indicated with a level one or a level two header. And that's what indicates a new slide. So slide one is a level two header, slide one, uh, two more pound signs, slide two, and that'll be slide two. And this allows you to structure your document in a way that you can read the source code, but the actual Quarto representation knows how to turn it from that source code into the final output that you're creating. So overall, you know, very short slide, but just one that shows you how quick you can get started with creating uh, slide decks with, with just a few lines of markdown code. There's also this idea of incremental lists. And an incremental list means that it increments across it. So you might have like three or four bullet points. And rather than displaying them all at once, you can actually have them be incremental, where it'll show bullet point one, then you click an arrow, bullet point two, click the arrow, bullet point three, and so on. So that you can actually walk through your slides like I'm doing today, as opposed to them all showing up at one time. So you can do this from the YAML header with incremental equals true, or you can turn it on and off via fence divs. So I might have something like this, where again, I use three, uh, colons to start, three colons to end, and then I have a dot incremental class. And this will work across any of the presentation formats. And it'll say first Howard sleeps, and then the next one, Howard sprints. He's always sleeping or running around in terms of he's, he's an active dog or he's a very sleepy dog. Um, but you can walk through the different parts of your presentation and control the overall structure in this way. You can also turn off incremental. So let's say that you had uh, incremental equals true, and you want to say that, well, you know, I want to say that Howard eats and then he sleeps. Like that's kind of one thought that I'm putting together, even though it's it's two different bullet points. So if he eats, he's immediately going to go take a nap. He's not going to go run around after that. So you can turn on or turn off these incremental lists from the YAML or from Pandoc uh, fence divs with the dot incremental or non incremental classes. You can also control the overall structure of your uh, presentation in terms of creating left and right columns or how those appear. This one's a bit more complex in terms of you have uh, what's called a dot columns class first. And you might notice I have four uh, colons here at the start and four colons at the bottom. This allows me to nest additional uh, fence divs within that kind of parent div. So overall, I have a dot columns class. And then I'm creating two or more columns that I want to create within it. So within the dot columns class, I create another uh, three colons with a dot column. And I can control the width. So you know, make it 50-50 or 40-60 or whatever kind of percentage I want from left and right. And then I'm also using reveal.js's dot fragment class that allows me to display the content on the left first and then display the content on the right after that's done. So you can kind of build off of these uh, classes and brackets and fence divs together and overall structure your document across different formats. So while those type of things are useful and that gets you a lot of the way in terms of if I stopped right there, you could actually get started making presentations. Like you could actually make a nice presentation from that. I do want to call out some specific Re Reveal.js options that are very powerful and allow you to do a lot of different things. So I'm going to have Rachel use one of our secret tips. So on this page, we can use Alt plus click to zoom into a section. And if I pop up this tiny picture of Howard on the screen, she can Alt click again to back out of that. And she can actually zoom in specifically on Howard. So you can imagine that you might have source code or you know something else on the page that looks small, but you can zoom in on it to highlight it. Rachel can also do command plus on her screen that will actually increase the size of things like the URL or the logo at the bottom. So she can zoom in a little bit on the page and that will actually uh, make that a bit bigger and zoom out a, a few times and make the URL a bit smaller. And overall, just make that part a little bit easier to work with. And that's part of the benefit of HTML is you can modify things temporarily on the fly. You can also use things called absolute positioning. So like that last image, I put it very specifically in the bottom left so that we had to go find it and zoom in on it. I use some code like this, another fence div, and I use the dot absolute class, and then I can say, what is the geometry? So from the bottom, 25 pixels up, 
and from the left, 100 pixels over, and then display the image as normally with a fragment class which shows up later. But you can place it anywhere on the screen in that way and really tightly control placement of images or logos or even text that you're putting on the page. It allows you to better tell stories as you're moving through it. Another one that I really like for Reveal.js is using what's called output-location. This is actually used within um, code chunks. So you might have something like this, where you're loading the ggplot package, doing a quick plot of empty cars. And then if I advance the slide, it throws that image directly next to it in the second column. And it's a fragment, so it shows up later. And this, again, allows you to step through showing the code and showing the output as you're moving through the document. There are many other output dash location classes, but just this is the one that I find the most useful in terms of delaying showing it and putting it in the column next to the source code. So I can have long source code and a nice image next to it. Just like with HTML or using PDF with different themes or kind of partials you're bringing in, um, Quarto presentations and specifically Reveal.js also come with built-in themes. So there's 10 themes listed here on the page, and you can apply those with the theme argument in the YAML header. And again, these will change all the different elements of the presentation, uh, including kind of the tables, the headers, the background colors, the foreground colors, lots of different elements that you can change on the fly very, very quickly. If for some reason you didn't think the theme was good enough or there was something that you didn't agree with, you can always customize it further and apply your own custom.scss file to modify specific components of the presentation. So like for today, I wanted to use a very specific font. You know, I like the Fira Mono uh, class of fonts for code. And at our studio, we use Open Sans as kind of our default font family. So I can import those fonts from the Google Fonts API and then apply some different colors, make the text at the bottom orange, make the level two headers this nice dark blue, kind of this R Studio blue, and also use Open Sans and Fira Mono as my default font and my monospace font. So again, I, you know, not a lot of code, but just modifying a little bit to make it look just like I want it to. So using a theme and making it go farther with some of these different customizations. I can also add a footer or specific logo. So I could use a local image. So maybe I have the RStudio logo locally at the bottom right of my slide, um, or I have some footer that says like footer text or a URL or another hyperlink to the source code. For my presentations, I like to, again, use the URL to the hosted RStudio logo so I don't have to keep bringing it around. I can just link out to the URL of that one. And then for the footer, I can also use the, uh, you know, a specific hyperlink. So with markdown style code, I can say reports and presentations with Quarto and then link out to the slides that are hosted on Quarto Pub. But for this page, you might notice the footer is not that in terms of you can actually change the footer as a one-off. And if you look at the very bottom, it's kind of small, but did you see, did you notice the footer? And using a fence div, you can apply a footer class and modify the footer slide by slide by slide. So for one footer, you might link out to this URL. And for the next one, it could be an entirely different footer. You can override the default that's defined in the YAML. But again, that will only apply for that uh, specific slide. So if I advance the next one, it'll go back to my overall URL. At this point, you're probably seeing dozens of pictures of Howard in his nice gentleman outfit. Uh, I've used what's called a slide background to overlay many different images across that. Not the most effective use of it, but just showing you a couple different possibilities of how you can use images or other things as your slide background to tell a story. I did that with um, you know, a level two header, slide background, and then used these uh, curly brackets to actually define specific things about it. So made the color equals black. The background image was one of Howard Gentleman. And I made them 100 pixels wide and repeated if they were not big enough to take up the whole screen. Overall, there's a lot of different things you can do with this. In addition to the background color, you can uh, use a local or a URL to an image. You can make the image cover the background or not cover, make it a specific size, change the opacity or the transparency. 
you can do a lot of customization to really make it easy to inject uh, background images to your slides. But you're not just limited to images. You can also use it with GIFs if you're using those to tell part of your story or tell a joke. And you can even use it to just change the color. So I might do something like slide background, background color equals black. And this will make the overall uh, body black, but make the text white. It will try and always do a high contrast color for changing the font color itself. So you don't have to do that manually. You can just change the background color and the foreground color will change along with it. And just like with images or GIFs, you can also do background videos. These are rather than background image, it would be background dash video, and you can control the looping or does it play audio or is it muted? And again, things like the size or the opacity. So you could actually embed a full size video taking up the entire screen if that was what you were trying to do in your slides or in your presentation. There's some other helpers. So things like R dash stack, and combining that with fragments. I can take three images and display them on top of each other very efficiently, um, one by one by one. Again, you might have like several different images in unison that you're displaying. So something like, here's a Boston Terrier in a field. Here's a juvenile Boston Terrier laying down on the ground. And here's an adult Boston Terrier wearing fancy clothing. And you can all kind of stack them on top of each other and apply them one by one by combining the .r stack and the fragment classes to display them overall. As we close out, we've got a couple more slides to go. I just wanna again call out Emil's article and kind of how he approached using color and custom styles uh, to apply and change his documents. I hyperlinked out to his article so that orange article will actually take you to his overall blog post. But in his SCSS uh, styles that he added, he included a dot blue and a dot yellow class. And these just inject a little bit of color to help tell his story a little bit differently in his presentations. So in action, he might write some text that looks like this. He uses bracketed spans to say quarto in blue enables you to weave together content, which will show up in yellow, and executable code in yellow into a finished presentation. To learn more about Cordo, makes it blue again, see this specific link. So by doing that, he's using the existing kind of context of bracketed spans, but adding in his own custom classes to style the document a little bit differently. And he gets a nice looking page like this, where you can really highlight that Cordo content, executable code, and finished presentation is the story here. So while he might read off the slide, or I might read off this slide, you can really see that we're focused on Quarto content executable code. And that's a nice summary of what Quarto provides. Content, text, and executable code all together. And you can further extend this with what you need to do or what you want to do with writing your own classes. Again, he used the bracketed span syntax. So, you know, square brackets around some text and then applying his specific uh, class to that. But you can also use RStudio's visual editor, and he actually talks about this in his article. And you can use, you know, insert a specific span or specific div, and then it'll pop up saying, what are the type of classes you want to apply to that? So this is really useful for maybe you can't remember all the different syntax. You can actually insert divs and spans with the visual editor inside RStudio. That's it for today. We, we got it all done in an hour somehow. We covered a lot of different things with reports and presentations, theming them, including HTML, PDF, doing reports and presentations together and separately, parameterized our markdown and parameterized Cordo and how those are different and the same. And I wanted to give you a few links out to some nice articles and, and content. So if you just want to read about Quarto, you can go to quarto.org slash docs slash guide. That's the overall guide for Quarto. But there's also sublinks to documents or articles and reports or journal articles if you're trying to publish in an academic setting. I also wanted to call out, again, a few of the open source efforts by other people outside of kind of the core Quarto team. So Quarto title pages by the group from NMFS. Uh, or Emil and Megan's articles on Slidecraft 101 and Quarto slides and what those look like. So a lot of nice content here. And you can access my slides at thomasmock.quarto.pub slash reports dash presentations. 
or uh, Rachel was kind enough to give me a short link, which is much better. rstd.io slash Cordo dash reports that has all the content for today. I thought that might be a little easier there. <laughs> Thank you so <laughs> much, ball. Tom. Really, really Absolutely. appreciate it. This is awesome. I'm just getting started with Cordo too. And this is really helpful thinking about some of the formatting I was trying to figure out. Um, awesome. There are so many great questions. <laughs> um, how long do we Thank have you for? I, I'm here for the, the full journey. So I blocked okay. off the remaining <laughs> part of this before lunch. So I'm, I'm in for the long haul. Awesome. Great. So thank you all for, for all the great questions. I did want to um, remind everybody that you can ask questions in LinkedIn if you're watching there on YouTube live, or you can ask anonymously. Um, and I will show that Slido here as well. I was also playing around with a few polls as well. So just nice. asking if people have used Cordo and what other journals you would like to see. So Tom, if there's other questions you want us to ask everybody else, feel free to Love put them it. in the, the private chat. Um, but one of the, let's go, we'll go back and forth between uh, YouTube and LinkedIn here. A question from Jimmy was, any plans to make Cordo template functionality uh, similar to what our Markdown draft does? If I'm being honest, I'm not very familiar with our Markdown draft. So give me uh, 10 seconds and I'll look up that function. But just very honestly, I'm, I'm not very familiar with the R Markdown draft option. Um, so let me make sure I understand the question and we'll go from there. So let's see. Ah, okay. So kind of like using it as a template is my understanding is R Markdown draft uh, creates and actually edits a draft of an R Markdown based on a template. So there's a couple ways of doing that in terms of uh, the R Studio dev team is working on some more integration of like there are R Markdown templates that exist in R Studio. And that's a kind of a first class idea of you can like new file, new R Markdown, use this specific template. The R Studio dev team is still working on that idea for Cordo. And then for um, Cordo documents themselves, you can use either the extensions kind of workflow or kind of other ways of bringing in kind of a overall document, importing code or specific chunks, and then further modifying it. But that's a good option. And I'll go back to the dev team and see if we have some additional thoughts there. But um, yeah, cool, cool to learn about the draft function and kind of learn something new on these presentations. Thank you. Um, a question from Slido was, can you apply the same code highlighting to different outputs? So for example, HTML or PDF without the call having to be nested under format? Yeah, so I would say that if you're doing something like styling, um, you're typically, you're, you're taking that step forward saying the defaults aren't good enough and I have very strong opinions. Um, so I would say the safest option is doing them separately because like PDF has certain things it can do and HTML has certain other things that it can only do. Um, so while there are times where you can reuse the components, like even when I was using um, the blood theme, which is kind of like a Dracula style theme for presentations, I rendered it to PowerPoint and some of the theming came across basically what changes it could make, but overall it wasn't one to one per se. So if you really want to go further and customize it, like there's first class ways of doing that in all the different formats. So PowerPoint, you can import a, uh, a template from PowerPoint PDF. You can do additional theming or um, tech partials. And for HTML, you can do CSS or SCSS to, to customize them. So while yes, you know, for code highlighting alone, there are some options where you can try and reuse it. There might be a time where you get frustrated and it's better to kind of hop out to, if you're really trying to do like PDF and make it look a certain way, further customizing it in that way. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to go over to, let's see. Trying to go over to uh, LinkedIn for one of the answers to this question. Yeah. So I will ask a different one first. Oh, wait, here it is. 
Daniel asks, any websites that, in your opinion, have the best uh, shiny Cordo output examples that you could share with others at your company? Yeah, I would say, you know, today what Cordo provides with integrating with Shiny is traditional websites in terms of there's not a dashboard style Cordo yet. That the Cordo team is actively working on dashboard style documents or dashboard layouts with Cordo that, that will come in the future. Um, but, you know, if you're really trying to invest in like Shiny and trying to make it look really beautiful with Shiny alone, uh, there's things like Shiny Dashboard or Fresh or BS Lib specific to Shiny that allow you to structure and, and kind of theme those overall documents. In the future, we'll have kind of a better answer for you, which is like if you're trying to create a dashboard with Shiny and Quarto together, um, there will be a first class dashboard format. However, if you're creating it today, it's it's basically going to look like a website that has shiny code built into it. So I would, you know, go to the cordo.org. There's a gallery and that has a lot of the content today and will be updated over time. Um, and I'll drop that chat link to Rachel. So she has the gallery link. Um, but, you know, today it talks about like interactive docs with shiny or with observable or Jupyter widgets. Um, but you know, they're really going to look like websites as opposed to dashboards right now. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I put that link into the chat. I also see cool. someone had shared it on LinkedIn a bit earlier too. So thank you nice. for sharing that. Um, someone else asked, um, are there built-in themes for PowerPoint? Yeah, so, you know, again, some of the theme components work um, across formats. So like I was using like the, the blood theme that's built in for Reveal.js and some of that came across into PowerPoint. Um, there is an article on Cordo.org for um, PowerPoint presentations specifically. And again, once you get into the level of theming, that basically says like, not only do I care about outputting to, to PowerPoint, but someone has strong opinions about that theme. Um, so if you use what are called PowerPoint templates, that's a first class idea in the PowerPoint world, both in and outside of Cordo. That is how you can use like a company theme that modifies the title page and the layout and the colors and the fonts for PowerPoint specifically. And because that's a proprietary format, there are some limitations around how much we can do that in Cordo, as opposed to how much of that is like the solved answer is use a template that the PowerPoint has. I really am, I'm really impressed by Tom's ability to talk and find the links at the same exact time and send them to me. So I just put that in the chat as well. Thanks, Rachel. Another one was, how do you keep long Cordo documents organized for yourself as you're working on a presentation? Yeah, there, there's a couple ways. If I'm being um, honest about like writing a presentation, I'm usually have many different things open in terms of like, I have some experimentation files that I'm like testing out specific ideas and then I'm putting those into the individual slides. But I will say that in terms of like, when I write Cordo documents in our studio, the level two headers, the code chunks, all of those show up in the document outline. Um, so if, if you use that, you can navigate pretty quickly, even through like an 800 or 900 line uh, presentation. So like today's one, cause it's almost 60 slides. I want to say it was around like 700 lines of text overall. Um, and using the uh, outline view in our studio allows me to kind of move between slides really quickly. Uh, especially if I'm like changing something at the title at the very first slide and then jumping to slide 50 like using those allows me to navigate the document a bit better. The other thing I will just mention is that Cordo, um, regardless of the format, does allow you to use what are called includes. So you can imagine that the final document I'm putting together for leadership might actually be from four or five different people. And they might actually write a specific section and then you could just import or what is called include them in the parent document. So if you look for includes on Cordo.org, um, it will actually allow you to access existing content and bring it into the parent document and actually just inject like all of that QMB or that markdown file in that location. So especially if you have like a bunch of different people working on one thing, yes, you could collaborate across source control, 
but they could also write their own kind of thing and you just bring it into the parent. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, this is a little bit of a longer question. Um, so essentially, like what are the benefits of converting from our markdown to Cordo, especially um, for someone who maybe has hundreds of, of our markdown reports? Yeah. I would say overall, the, the beauty is that we support both in terms of if I say we as in our studio, like the core team that works on our markdown is the same team that works on Cordo. So you don't have to change everything, which is a great thing. Like if someone told you tomorrow, hey, stop doing what you're doing and move to this, that would be very disruptive. And that's not the goal of, of anything with Cordo. There are differences and there are trade-offs and benefits for using Cordo or using our markdown for certain situations. But especially if you've got like a thousand line R markdown report or you've got a workflow that's working, great. Like keep using it. Like we're continuing to support our markdown. We're, we're not like abandoning it. We are still doing bug fixes and, and kind of improvements over time. Just if you think about it with like new features, there were limitations in terms of how we extended our markdown. The way to extend our markdown was to write another R package that extended it. And with Quarto, a lot of it is baked into the one install. So rather than having to manage multiple packages or have it be only with R, we're trying to not only improve things for our R users, but also bring essentially like all of our markdown to the Julia language and to Python and to teams that don't even use code. Like just bring a, a visual editor and markdown style scientific communication uh, without having to manage data science languages. So it's a bit hard of a question to answer in a short format, but I would say just like, if you have existing R Markdown, you can keep using them. For basic R Markdown, you can use Quarto to actually render or convert those, but you definitely don't have to convert over. And would, for somebody hoping to convert some of their docs, is that Welcome to Quarto Workshop a good resource or, or what would you yes. recommend? Yeah, that, that first uh, overview, as well as uh, some of the content on Quarto.org, it talks about uh, taking an existing R markdown and a basic one at that, where the um, conversion cost is essentially zero because Quarto and R markdown are, are essentially backwards compatible with each other. The difference being that like R markdown has specific CSS and PDF and LaTeX that it applies. And Quarto does things a little bit different visually. Like the, the code will still work between them for the most part, but the visual representation is different between the two. Great. Yeah, the, the two you. hour webinar had some, some additional content that would go over that. Awesome. Um, I see a question from Rob on LinkedIn that was, would things like check boxes or radio buttons be available or would one need shiny for that level of complexity? There's a couple ways to approach it. Um, so yes, if you want checkboxes and radio buttons that execute R code, then you would need Shiny, right? Because you have to have a server that takes that checkbox you're doing and executes it along with some R code. However, um, both in R, in Python, and in JavaScript within Quarto, there are things for checkboxes or, or cross-language talking. So. In R, there's things called HTML widgets and crosstalk. That provides basic filters and select with checkboxes and little buttons. In Python, there's something called IPython widgets or IPy widgets that, again, give you both a JavaScript kind of framework and then some, some toggles you can do with it. Or native to kind of the JavaScript land, but also applies to other languages, observable.javascript is included with Quarto. So you can build out custom kind of interfaces and checkboxes, um, you know, just through Quarto alone that interact with both R and Python code. So I'll, I'll drop a link to Rachel for observable JavaScript. That's going to look very similar to Shiny in terms of like the, the buttons you're expecting. Um, and it can be in, embedded with R and with Shiny and with Python. Um, but it's actually JavaScript that you're writing just in a very friendly way. Like it's a great library and I'm, I'm glad it was included with uh, the integration into Quarto. Great, thank you. Um, heading back over to Slido, some of the yeah. questions over there. 
any plans to add more categories to the author argument in the YAML? Um, because it's well known, you can add authors and affiliations, but it would be cool to also add role. Yeah, absolutely. So the the default things that are available from Cordo are kind of limited to what's available for like the categories and the author, especially once you get into specific journal formats, the uh, author section and affiliations really expand because certain articles and certain journals want new things added on. Like there are requirements. So um, yes, some of the journal articles that already exist, those journal article extensions allow for this. And if you're interested, you can also add your own format that adds whatever you want. Like you could add a uh, favorite pet as an author argument to your YAML and just like write an extension that provides that. Um, if you wanted to learn more about that, I would look at the kind of article templates um, that you can modify on Cordo.org. And those are kind of like .tech formats or, or CSS that you're bringing in that allow you to further extend what's available in the YAML header. And that, that's really what those extensions are for, is adding on custom things that you want to see that maybe aren't as generally uh, used. Awesome. Thank you. And I see you had shared with me, Tom, a, a question for everybody. And it was, what yeah. kind of Cordo content would you like to see in the future? And so I just put that as a poll over on the Slido as well, cool. if you want to share there. Awesome. Okay. I see someone just asked a question over on LinkedIn, and it is, uh, Mayank asked, can we include custom HTML, CSS, JavaScript code combination for parts of a Cordo document as we did with our markdown? Yeah, absolutely. So there's option, when I talked about includes from before, that include could be used for including child documents or other QMDs, but I also just dropped a link for Rachel called includes, you know, before body, after body, in header, resources, metadata files. Those different options allow you to include like literal JavaScript code or CSS or like Google, Google Analytics.html files that are injected into the document. And those are able to be included in a couple of the most common locations. So before the body, after the body, in the header, like there's specific locations where HTML needs to inject that type of metadata for it to be used by the website. So Cordo has a first class support for doing that with the include dash something else options. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Arun asked on YouTube, does Cordo work with uh, sharing gun? Yeah, so um, it there's a long answer and a short answer, and I'll try and do both quickly. So the uh, the long answer is that Sharingan uses a library called Remark.js, which is not Pandoc compatible mark Markdown. So while it was useful with uh, our Markdown, it's funny, like Yi Wei was actually talking about it. He never intended for it to be popular. It was for his use. Um, and it required what he called like ninja level knowledge to, to do certain things with it. Um, Reveal.js is Pandoc compatible Markdown. So that's the one that, that Cordo settled on as the HTML format is that because you could use it with the visual editor and it was compatible with all the rest of Pandoc, um, that was the one that they, they settled on. If you take an existing Sharingan presentation uh, and try and render with Cordo, it will work in terms of, I'm putting that in scare quotes, um, it will render it into some type of presentation. But Sharingan used a lot of custom themes, a lot of custom CSS, custom classes, and different ways of writing that is just not fully compatible with, with Cordo. That all being said, and continuing the long answer, I was a Sharingan absolute power user, loved using it, and I've fully converted over to doing Reveal.js. I really, really enjoy it. I, if you know, if I wanted to, I could still write Sharingan, but Reveal.js adds in a lot of things that clicked with me. And again, the unified syntax across all of HTML is nice, where I don't have to remember how do I do it in this one specific package, but this is the way to do it across all HTML style outputs in Cordo what was a nice option. Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. Quick reminder, if anybody's looking for the content and slides from the talk today, I'll just share the link up here on the screen again. Um, I see a few Slido questions that I have a lot of upvotes right now. Cool. And one is, any plans of creating tutorials um, for dot, I don't think I know what this is, but dot TX templates for PDF output for Cordo would be amazing. Yeah, so there's some ongoing work for uh, writing things like Lua filters um, and, and other things like that. Um, let me see if I can find the Lua development and creating formats. So this article I'm sharing with Rachel has some of the information about like when you're writing a custom format, what all do you need to include? Um, ultimately, in terms of like, while we might end up writing like dot tech uh, template examples or, or theming components. Tech is its own massive ecosystem. And while you might be able to get introduced to it from um, Quarto.org, for example, it's such a broad topic that I'd be afraid that lots of things would get left out. So ultimately it's like, if your team, you know, what Quarto is trying to provide is a lot of very common and powerful templates. So things like journal articles where I could publish to this journal without knowing any tech, right? Like that, that is my mindset. I don't know any LaTeX and I can still publish in the format that this journal wants. So JSS wants this, you know, LaTeX file that they're getting. I can do that with Quarto. If I want to customize PDF to go a certain way, I really need to learn a little bit of tech or tech partials uh, to, to further customize that. And that's a skill that I would need to develop to be successful in that role. Um, so yes and no in terms of there's some documentation around creating formats and how that can be used for specific things and distributing them, developing filters and things with Lua, um, but there aren't major plans for, for tech templates today. Again, I do want to call out that like uh, the open source community has already started building out some of these. So I'll call it again, this group. Um, and they're in the gallery on Quarto.org. They actually put together um, source code for, for kind of how they've approached building out those. So grabbing that content in FMS, uh, Quarto Pandoc. I'm actually looking for this one. So give me a second to find those, or I could go back to my presentation and just do it that way. There we go. All right. So I'm going to drop this into the chat for Rachel. So that one actually uh, talks about how to modify their templates and how to modify and use and DIY some of it. That resource is amazing. Like it's a great amount of work they did to both do it, but then also write about how they did it. So while that won't teach you everything about .tech and partials and everything else, it at least gives you like a nice structured way of learning. And again, because it's an open source project, over time, additional people, including us and others, will build out educational content or, or kind of extension content around that. So specifically the how to use DIY and how to modify on that link that Rachel just shared. And if you wanted to actually screen share that page, um, that I can walk you through uh, some of that on the side. It's a it's a great site, and kudos to that team. Awesome. Let me get that up. I yeah, was just sorry. trying to uh, copy over yeah. to LinkedIn too, yeah. and just let everybody know if you're looking for these real time links and you're watching on LinkedIn. I wasn't able to do both at the same time, so yep. if you want to head over to YouTube, but uh, here, let me put this up. Yeah. So th again, this page has like seven or eight templates that they provide that are great. Like they just work out of the box. But off of the left sidebar, if you see the how to use DIY or how to modify, those actually, if you click on like how to modify, um, it talks about, you know, <laughs> the first thing, modifying Pandoc templates sounds like fun. Like, yes, it's kind of uh, tongue in cheek. But, you know, you can modify it, how it works, what is going on. And it talks a little bit about like what the things you do for Cordo, as well as like some of the things you use for their specific format. But again, because there's so much customization you can do in the .tech file that's completely separate from Cordo, um, you do at some point have to learn that if you, if you really want to customize all of that yourself. 
But this is a great starting page. It talks about the LaTeX structure and all sorts of other things. I would go here. Great, great resource. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's go through as many questions as we can get to. And I promise I will share all these other questions with yeah. you, Tom, if we don't get Sounds to good. something. Okay. Um, so if this is an anonymous question, if we know we want to use a number of parameters, do we have to give one of those parameters as a default in the YAML? Yeah, so you'll want to define them at least because you could imagine that when you're trying to render it, if you have a if you indicate it in the body of the document, it has to have a default value. So if you don't define it in the YAML, then when the document is just rendered with like the render button or Cordo render, um, it's going to fail because that object doesn't exist. And it's like, I don't know where to find this. It doesn't exist. So you will need to define at least some default in the YAML that's used for the first rendering, and then you can modify it further. That really applies to both like the body of the document because you have to write, you know, params, dollar sign syntax, or, or use in, in Python, you have to at least like use that object. And again, if it's not defined, then Python or R are just not going to know what to do with an object that's not defined. I love to see people are helping answering each other, answer each other's questions awesome. in the Slido as well. Um, but one of those I thought might be helpful to just cover here too is, yeah. how can we include the current date yes. in the YAML file? You don't even have to use sys.date. You can do date equals today, date colon today. Uh, one of my favorite, uh, someone actually asked me about that this morning just before coming on to the presentation. And it's one of my favorite tricks because it's language agnostic. So again, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to do it, you know, only within using sys.date, but on Cordo dates and formatting, there's a built-in default for using date equals today or date equals now or date equals last dot modified. So there's multiple things you can do with it in terms of like, did you modify it today? Did you modify it with a specific time as well as the date? Or when was the last time the document was modified, not rendered, right? Like those are all separate things. And if you just did sys.date, it's not as flexible as some of those things that are just built in free options that are awesome now. And I, I love those things. Okay, so Tom, you just got really excited about that one. So I'm I, curious. Dates and tables your, are apparently my thing. What is your favorite thing that you've learned in switching over to Cordo where you're like, wow, that was amazing. I think the biggest, just like kind of like mind blown, like absolute new feature for me was, was freeze with projects. Um, there's so many little bitty things that are cool, like date equals today and unified syntax and listings. But if I were to identify one or two, and I just thought of two, we'll stick with those. One is for projects. Um, freeze equals true, which allows me to store the computation for an entire project, like for my personal blog that's five years old, I can store the computation from the first article I wrote five years ago, and I don't have to re-render that one every time. So that's super powerful for collaboration or for um, just like managing uh, documents over time. I dropped a link to Rachel for that one. The other one that's kind of just like mind blowing is website listings um, because you can basically create custom listings and build out like summaries and cards and um, little grid layouts of all this different type of content manually or from source files and just built very nice looking pages, like just remarkably complex in, in a good way. Um, I have to link out to this and we're going to screen share it. So sorry, one more, but this is the page that gets me excited about custom listings. And I just dropped that in the chat. If you want to screen share that, uh, connect widgets, fake one about listings specifically. So the reason why I find this so cool is like, if you look at this page, it's a summary of a large end-to-end -end data science task. And we're hosting it on like RStudio Connect, but in terms of like, there's all these different things it's doing. 
So it provides this kind of background of where you can say like, here's the diagram of all the things that are occurring. There's a Cordo document, there's Vetiver, there's APIs, they're all communicating together. And as you navigate down the page, uh, if you go further to like schedule jobs and things like that, keep going. There's tabs and cards and other different things that allow you to just like move through all these assets you've created. Like this data science team put together 15 different things that make up this complex, robust data science project. And with listing pages, you're actually able to aggregate these into tables with filters and sorting and cards. And all of that's natively built into Cordo as like a first class thing. So you don't have okay, to escape do out to. <laughs> I've been trying to figure <laughs> out this one. How do you do this? I got source code for that one. The answer is lots of YAML, but let me grab, I'll, I'll share you the GitHub repo so we can share that out as well. Cause okay. this is like the mind blowing one to me is just like all of that. I'll, I'll drop one more link to you, Rachel, here in the chat. So that is a public uh, repository called test dash listing. And it goes through basically the idea of building the connect widgets R package only with Cordo. So you don't have to use kind of the structure of, of connect widgets, but you can rebuild all of that formatting with cards and uh, grid and, and tables. So I really like this. That was like a motivating listings are really cool. You should try them out. That's amazing. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Cheers. Um, I mean, I'll try to go through just a few more questions. I know yes. we can't, we could stay on here all day, but we can't really. So, okay. Um, so going over to John's question on YouTube, is there a styler for Cordo like an RStudio add-in? So there's a package called BSLib that has a first class plugin for exploring themes for our markdown. Um, I do imagine at some point BSLib theming will probably be available in Cordo, but it's not today. So my answer is there is not a RStudio add-in as of this moment in time that might change over time. Um, boot swatch theme picker, I'm, I'm just looking. Uh, I believe, okay, there might be an option for just like modifying Bootswatch in terms of like those are the 25 themes that are built into uh, Cordo. There's probably an application that hosts a Bootswatch theme modifier because that's really what's happening is Bootstrap CSS, Bootswatch is the opinionated themes and you can modify them. Um, so no, there's not, but that's a good idea and we're probably already working on it. Great, thank you. Okay, maybe we're having too much fun with the polls over here, but I just wanted to ask <laughs> one more over there. Um, and it doesn't have to be related to Cordo, but I was just wondering for people listening in, what is a challenge that you face in the past few weeks that we could explore creating content for? And it doesn't have to be like code specific or, or Cordo. It could even be about like people focus or your organization. Um, but just wanted to ask that everybody to everybody as we think about like what would be most helpful for you all. Um, and that's just on the, the Slido. You can access the poll there. Okay. Uh, one other question from Slido. Can you please quickly throw light on how to publish a Cordo document to CordoPub with the YAML attributes setting file? YAML attributes. I'm assuming, I don't want to assume too much. Let me make sure. Uh, YAML attributes is kind of a loaded term in terms of. We could ask for clarification yeah if you, wanna, um... if you want to clarify on that one so cordo pub i would say the the best resource is that like cordo pub is is a first class kind of description with the documentation on cordo.org and it has a publish.yaml uh example i think that's probably what you're talking about in terms of that's a yaml file that allows you to modify settings for a specific cordo pub 
Um, you could include that around the context of like your existing project. For most people, um, the way that you would use Quarto Publish or Quarto Pubs is you would, from the terminal, you would do Quarto Publish, Quarto dash pub, and then the file you want to publish. And it will then walk you through interactively the process of like selecting your credentials and yes, you want to name it this and publishing that. With uh, Quarto Pub and the underscore publish.yaml, or if you're doing that non-interactively with something like continuous integration or GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps or RStudio Connect, um, you can go further and basically like write some of those ahead of time because you aren't going to be there to, to do those steps. That's, a, again, a pretty big thing to think about. So there's a lot, there's like a whole section on publishing on Quarto.org that's fairly new. So maybe last time you were looking, it wasn't there, but it has like description of the underscore publish.yaml, the publish command, as well as the non-interactive publishing with continuous integration. Um, and I think I, yeah, I shared that with Rachel and she'll show that in the chat. Perfect. Um, okay. Few other questions. One from Slido: Is there a comprehensive Quarto cheat sheet or web page? Yeah, they clarified and said, "I'm finding bits and pieces of code for the YAML header and code chunks, but nothing comprehensive." So the best option, if you, it's not, it's not a cheat sheet at all, but I would consider it more of like a reference or an appendix. So if you go to Quarto.org/docs/reference. Um, or at the top of Quarto.org, there's a reference here, header. Then. Yeah, okay. perfect. Quarto.org. Um, and then at the top, it says reference, that fourth item. Okay. This provides for all of the formats and different things you can do, what is possible. So these are this is not expanding on it in great detail. It's just describing it. But let's say for YAML header, if you click on documents, the HTML, the first one uh, there, these are all the YAML options you can provide. And then they're structured by what is like the grouping. So this is pretty bare bones, but it like tells you what's possible and what does it actually mean? This is also duplicated. So when you're writing Quarto documents in our studio or in VS Code with the Quarto extension, if you do control plus space inside the YAML header, it will basically pull up this list and you can start filtering it. So you could say like, you know, start typing title and it will say like title is something you can autocomplete and describing it as the document title. But this reference section gives you a massive amount of just, I want the highlights or the cheat sheet of like all the different uh, things that are possible. And then if you want to go into like, how would I actually use them? That's where the guide section would be more useful. Okay. And that was control plus space. Yep, control plus space inside the YAML header or inside a hash pipe in the code chunk will basically like pull up a search bar essentially of like what, what is possible that you can do inside our studio. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are a few questions that touch upon this. Um, Ch Chamath, and apologies if I mispronounce your name, asks, is there going to be a Quarto dashboard offering similar to Flex dashboard? Yes, there will be in the future, coming soon, TBD. Okay, great. Let's, okay, two more questions, I, I promise. Cool. Um, okay, let me just double check on Slido, the most, that we answered the most upvoted ones too. Okay, another uh, YAML question <laughs> for cool. you. Yeah. One was the YAML file option for Cordo CLI. Um, to set parameters was not mentioned. Any reason? Yeah, so uh, execute params is a sub command there for, if you think of a QMD, and I'm kind of thinking of that as like the first thing that I'm working on is like a .QMD file. Um, in that context, every time you execute the document, it executes it from top to bottom linearly and re-executes everything. For Jupyter Notebooks, using like Python, for example, 
a Jupyter notebook can be uh, ex rendered with the stored execution because a Jupyter notebook behind the scenes is actually a .json file that actually stores the computation that when it was executed. Um, so you can either do that and use whatever the parameters were that were in the document as is the defaults, or if you use dash dash execute dash params, the one that uh, the question has been asked about, that will basically like force an execution or reference an external file in some cases. Like maybe you don't, um, you can imagine like writing out dash param one, dash param two, dash param three, dash param four, like continuing on and through the CLI is a lot of typing. So if you use like a, a, a external params.yaml file, that will simplify uh, the writing of it because you have like a file that has all those different parameters defined that you're bringing in. Great, thank you. Okay, um, one other question that was asked on I think YouTube, shoot, just lost it. Okay, how do you install Cordo extensions? Yep, so from the, uh, there's two options for Cordo extensions um, are text files or, or zip files. So you can literally download it and copy and paste it over. Like, I just want to say like, that's totally possible. But um, if you look at the extensions uh, page on Cordo.org, it actually walks through how to install extensions. So from the Cordo command line interface, you could do like Cordo install extension font awesome or Cordo install extension, Cordo extension uh, video or Lightbox, And it will install that extension into a folder in your project. Um, so the Cordo command line interface is the correct way to do that. But I just want to note that they are literally text files. So you can download it and like copy it or move it around between folders if you wanted to. Just the Cordo command line interface provides a, a helper function to do that efficiently. Great. Thank you. I realized I just threw 42 minutes of questions at you. So <laughs> <laughs> really appreciate it, Tom. Thank you Absolutely. for an awesome talk as well. One last question. It, if people are looking for like the best way to stay up to date on new Cordo features mm -hmm. or where to go and how to like get in touch with the Cordo team, what's the best way yep. to do that? So if I were to say stay up to date, um, Cordo has a news, let me see if there's the getting started. Do, 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 do. All right, so on the download page, if you wanna open this up, um, and screen share that one. Um, so if you wanted to get to there, and we'll start from the beginning, if you click on Get Started at the top of Cordo, and you see it has the default, it says like Linux, Mac, Windows, you can install. If you see that release notes and more downloads below Windows in the table. Uh, yep. If you click on that, it'll take you to the download page. And then if you scroll down, it'll say, here's all the things that have happened in the latest version. So you can see that the team's doing a lot of really cool work and adding a lot of things. Um, that's in the current released version. And if you scroll back up, it also links out to the um, kind of pre-release next version, the alpha that's coming out in the future. And that also has uh, release notes at the bottom of the page that we'll talk about like wh what's coming down the pipeline or wh what are they working on. Um, ultimately, like because certain things release quickly, just like that page is going to be the best uh, broad overview of what's coming and what's happening. Um, but if you do have questions in terms of like that's a uh, a poll kind of thing, like I just want to read about what's happening. Great, I can go there. If you're running into trouble or if you have questions for the dev team, at the top of that page under help. It says, ask a question. That button will take you to uh, the Cordo uh, dev uh, GitHub discussions. And there you can ask specific questions and the team can assist. Or the best thing to do is to search for your question there. 
I guarantee that for a lot of things, other people have asked questions about your topic and you might actually be able to find the answer there before we can put it into like documentation form or into a new feature. So you can search for all sorts of different things and say like, hey, there's weird behavior or I'm not quite understanding. And someone may have already asked that question or the, the dev team might have um, answered that question or said, oh, this is a problem. We'll, we'll turn it into a GitHub issue, for example. That's cool. I didn't, even, I didn't realize that was right from the Cordo site too. Yeah. Cool. The, the short so answer much. to everything is Cordo.org has all of your answers or we'll send you to the place to ask more questions. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Tom. Really, really appreciate it. Of uh, just want to let everybody know that this recording is available immediately after the talk ends. It's just at the same YouTube live link. Um, and I will try and go through probably not within the next hour or so, but I'm going to go grab all those links that Tom shared and put them with the recording as well but you should be able to see them in the chat too. But thank you, everybody. Thanks so much for staying and hanging out with us as well. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Thanks, Rachel.